recorded. So, all right, we are recording now and I will turn it over to Anna Kraft. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm really glad to see all of y'all. And uh, before we get started, I wanna say this is a run through for a session I'm doing next week for Sam's research and application webinar series. And at the end, perhaps after the recording is off, if y'all have feedback about any of the content, things that are not clear, things that might be explained differently or better, um, this is the first time I've done this particular session. So I would love to be able to incorporate any feedback that you have um, for next week's session for campus. Um, so I'm going to stop my video to prevent some or preempt some slowness with my computer and I'm going to start my slideshow and we will get started. All right, so I am bringing up Chrome and I am hopefully successfully about to present this uh these slides moving a little bit slowly oops working i can see them great um let me actually go back to the beginning great all right so our session is help predatory journal what do i do and uh this is me i'm the coordinator of metadata services here in the university libraries and this is what we're going to do today so we're going to do a quick overview of predatory publishing, <clears throat> what the, <clears throat> excuse me, what that means. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that because we want to get into some questions about what actually happens when you or another researcher is involved and in, uh, gets entangled with predatory journals. So what happens if a predatory journal solicits my work? What happens if I submit my work to a journal and I later discover that it is or that it might be predatory? What happens if a predatory publication lists me as a member of their editorial board without asking my permission? What do researchers do? These are all things that have happened to people at UNCG. And we'll also talk about some resources that can help you identify and avoid predatory journals. And at any point, if you have got uh, questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat and I will try to pay attention um, to that as we go through. So first, a little disclaimer. Involvement with predatory journals can actually bring up legal issues, particularly related to copyright and to the unauthorized uses of names and likenesses of people and institutions like UNCG. So I'm a librarian, I don't have a law degree, I'm not a lawyer, and I can't offer legal advice. So what this presentation is, is really general advice. Every situation is going to be different when it comes to dealing with predatory journals, and you as an individual need to think about your particular situation before you determine how to proceed. And if you need assistance, you definitely can reach out. I am available and there are some other routes that you can take within the university also, which we'll talk about. So first, a quick overview of predatory publishing. What does this mean? This is a definition that I like. Y'all may have seen it in previous related presentations. This came from a comment piece that was published in the journal Nature in 2019 from an interdisciplinary research group. So people, all across disciplines, predatory publishing does not just affect libraries or any specific discipline. It affects researchers in pretty much any discipline that might be publishing article-based scholarship. So predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and they're characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices a lack of transparency and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. And we'll see some examples of these things as we go through this. So a question for y'all, what are predatory publishers trying to do? Any thoughts, feel free to enter them in the chat or if you would like to unmute yourself, you can also do that. Yes, <laughs> so the answer is kind of on this slide. They are trying to make money, yes. 
um, they're trying to make money specifically from your work that you have worked really hard on without adding any value of their own. So these publishers are charging publication fees to authors, but they aren't providing legitimate peer review to vet that research. And they probably aren't providing any other publishing services either. There are things that publishers do like copy edit, layout uh, edit, proofreading, other things to make sure that that scholarship is not only reviewed, but is uh, presented in a way that makes sense and that people can access and read. So these predatory publishers are pretty much just taking things that people submit and slapping them up online uh, at a charge. This is not what we want out of our scholarship. It's not very ethical, but there are some pretty big impacts also. This wastes money, including tax dollars and grant money, because often authors are paying these APCs in some cases with funding from their institution or funding from their grant. And we really don't want our institutional funding or our grant funding and our tax dollars to go toward paying these article processing charges for predatory journals. Also, this can impact authors. People who publish with predatory journals may later have the legitimacy of their scholarship called into question. So this could impact somebody getting a job. It could impact somebody getting tenure. It can have pretty serious impacts for people. But potentially even worse, at a larger level, this unreviewed scholarship, things that have not been through peer review, is being presented online as having been vetted, which misleads readers, and that can have serious consequences. So say someone publishes in a predatory journal about perhaps vaccine uh, efficacy or lack thereof, and the research hasn't actually been through peer review. You might have individuals then finding that article and thinking it's real. And that can go for a lot of different medical treatments or uh, and other areas as well. So there are a lot of ways that this can have serious impacts for people all over the place. So there are a lot of red flags that are associated with predatory journals. And I'm not gonna read all of them right now. We will see some examples of some of these things on some upcoming slides. This uh, next slide also has more red flags as well as some links to examples. This first one mimicking the name or website style of more established journals. We're gonna see an example of that, uh, but there's also a link. This is called uh, hijacking journals in some cases. So if you would like to see more examples, there's a link to that, as well as examples further down the slide of journals that cite fake or non-existent impact factors. So they just make up impact factors to make them see, themselves seem more prestigious. We definitely don't wanna be publishing in that kind of journal. Direct email solicitations are really common with predatory publishing. And there's kind of a pattern for how these are set up. Often they are citing or uh, referencing a specific article that an author has recently published. And what these publishers are doing is, I think they're just looking at table of contents from recent journals and pulling names, email addresses, and titles of articles and contacting people, thinking that, all right, these people are authors, they are publishing, they are doing research. Maybe we will get some hits out of these people who want or need to publish. But there are some red flags related to the research area that they are soliciting may not have anything to do with your research area. Often there's poor grammar and or spelling. Although unfortunately, some of these journals are getting a little uh, better in terms of their practices with tricking people. So we aren't always seeing poor grammar and spelling and some of these very blatant red flags. Also, we may see opportunities, quote unquote, to join editorial boards as part of these solicitations. And this is a way that journals try to make themselves look more legitimate or more prestigious by having real people associated with their journals, real academics who are uh, doing legitimate work in their fields. So here's an example of a recent solicitation that I received. This is one that I get uh, regular solicitations from this journal. 
and they tell me they are deeply impressed by your previous article published in the other journal. This letter carries our sincerity of the invitation for you to publish your new papers in the peer-reviewed journal, American Journal of Information Science and Technology. So there's some grammatical problems and there are even some kind of character problems with uh, what we see in this solicitation. We do, yeah, the, the bees publish and published uh, there's something going on with the keyboard or the uh, characters that they're using. Uh, we don't want to publish here. This is not somewhere we want to send our scholarship. Here's another one that's even worse, that makes actually less sense. Um, this is another recent one that I received that it just is kind of, uh, what do these things mean? Last date of paper submission, 10 July, 2021. Notif notification of publication due date publication date within five days after registration. Like, what do these things mean? This is not what we would expect from a real journal. And then further down, AGER is a non, is nonprofit, non-loss organization. AGER is group of scientists, research persons of more than 25 countries, not any publication firm for their mandatory benefits. This is kind of garbled gobbledygook. Nobody wants to send their scholarship to this publication, but these are just example of, examples of things that we might see from predatory journals. ISO information, is it real? Probably not. <laughs> I did not, uh, did not feel like I needed to fully research this journal since it is so blatantly uh, just kind of clearly predatory. Um, so I didn't look up that, but that is probably, I would bet a case where they are using a fake or non-existent impact factor. Although ISO, like that's not a journal impact factor. Um, so yeah. How can we evaluate journals to make sure that they aren't predatory? Because not all of them are as blatantly bad as the examples that we just saw. So there's some good sites out there. One that I have recommended a lot is called Think, Check, Submit. And they offer a checklist, which is shown here, to walk through some things to consider with the journal and their practices. And all of these things are great things to think about. One thing that can make things a little bit difficult is that sometimes it's not always clear. Some journals are kind of in gray areas where maybe some things about them are good, some things about them, maybe it's not exactly, uh, they're not clear about some kind of practice. There might be positives and negatives about any given journal. And people really have to think about for themselves what they want out of their publication venues. So there may not be a clear answer in all cases. Another evaluation tool that I just learned about recently is called Journal Evaluation Tool. And this was created by librarians at Loyola Marymount, uh, including one of our colleagues who used to work here at UNCG. And it's freely available online. Anybody can use it. It offers a rubric and it's actually pretty long. I've got part of it shown on this slide, but it's much longer than this. And it comes with a scoring sheet to help aid in evaluation of the journal. So it, this, if you really want to dive deep about a particular journal that you're thinking about, this will walk you through a lot of things to look at. And you can see here, they've got good characteristics, fair characteristics, and poor characteristics associated with three, two, one scoring. And then you would use the rubric to, or the scoring sheet to um, add up what you have tallied or what you have learned about the journal. I haven't actually used this yet. It's, I've looked through it and I think that the information they've got is really good. Um, so this is available for people who might want a really detailed look at this type of uh, evaluation characteristic or evaluation rubric for journals. But if you need assistance with evaluating journal quality and these rubrics aren't working for you, librarians can help. I like to suggest that people start with their liaison librarian. Every department has a library liaison. If you're not sure who your liaison is, there's a link on this slide. And your liaison is really your first point of contact with the library. And I can help with this stuff too, but it's, I think it's best if people start with their liaison and then they can loop me in as needed. All right, 
So let's get into some of these questions we started off with. What if a predatory journal solicits my work? What should I do? Why do I keep getting spammed by emails inviting me to publish in predatory journals? I mentioned this a, a few slides ago. Um, but if you publish article-based scholarship, you are probably going to be contacted by predatory journals. And it may happen pretty regularly. Here we've got another example from the American Journal of Information Science and Technology. I think I hear from them a couple times a year. Um, they are impressed by my published article. The other un unpublished articles from you are warmly wel welcome to be published in our journal. Sure, thanks, but also no, I will not be sending you my scholarship. Some solicitation emails are just blatantly predatory. This one from Invention Journals, which claims to be the best indexed peer-reviewed international journal, and that it is a monthly based journals which are used to publish on exact dates since last six years. We're not gonna send our scholarship here. We can just mark this as spam and delete it. Um, Patrick says best index reminds me of the best cup of coffee in Elf. <laughs> yes, um, journals can say anything about themselves on the internet. Clearly, this is not the best indexed peer reviewed international journal in any subject area. So you might take a screenshot, save it for a presentation, show it to your friends, have a little laugh, but not we're not going to send our scholarship to these places. Unfortunately, it's not always that easy. What should you do when you're not sure about a journal? Sometimes you might receive a solicitation that's very detailed and that sounds like it could be real. Um, and you wanna check more into whether or not the journal is something that you might consider. So first, I would recommend against clicking on links directly in the email. You don't know where they're going to send you. It might appear that it's linking to one thing, but actually link to something else. And don't respond, don't even think about responding until you have done your research. So look up the journal first before you think about responding. Patrick asks, do you receive solicitations from real journals? Is that normal for non-predatory journals to do? That is a great question. And it is possible Yes, I have received a couple of real solicitations from real journals with publication opportunities, but I think for every one of those that I've received, I've probably gotten 10, 15, 20 from predatory publications. So it is less likely to receive real publication solicitations. Journals have so much content that is coming into them that they don't, they often don't have to reach out to people. If maybe they're doing a special issue or there's like a guest editor and there's a very specific topic that they're addressing, they might be contacting people. Yes, like Jenny says, you presented this conference, we're doing a special issue, um, or you, your research is related to this special issue topic, then there is a more uh, likely possibility that they might be reaching out to people directly. But generally, it is much more likely to be predatory if you are being solicited directly. So start by using your preferred search engine. Look up the journal. Don't just read what the journal says about itself. Look for what others are saying about it as well. This is something that Jenny and I have spoken about called lateral reading, where you are not just reading what the institution or the individual says about themselves, but other opinions as well. And often what I do in that case is I search for like the journal title and the word predatory. And you can get uh, some interesting information sometimes that way. Also look carefully at the journal's title and publisher. Is it really what it says it is? I'll show an example in a little more detail with that in just a moment. You might wanna use those checklists, think, check, submit, or the journal evaluation tool to help you. And if you're not sure after all of these things, you might contact your librarian for an additional uh, second opinion. And to be clear, title alone is not always enough to evaluate a journal, unfortunately. So titles cannot be copyrighted. 
We see books sometimes that have the same title as another book, and the same thing can go for journals. So there are two journals out there with the title Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology. And one of them was founded in 1870. It is published by Oxford. It's associated with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in the UK. It is an established journal that's been around for a long time. There is another journal with the exact same title that is published by David Publishing Company. And they reached out to one of our, I think she was a graduate student. And I'm really glad that she forwarded the whole email to me instead of just sending me the title of the journal. Because if I had just searched on Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology, this Oxford journal would have been the one that came up. And this other journal might not have even been at the top or the first couple of pages of results. So it's important to know the name of the publisher as well. <laughs> yeah, David Publishing, um, that on the right, that email snippet is presented exactly as it was received. The journal is the one that hi highlighted David Publishing. And I would bet because it's because they're trying not to get sued. So you are going to need, if somebody comes to you and says, this is the journal that solicited me, is it real? Ask them who the publisher is. Um, and yes, there, there are other red flags in that email as well. Um, so yeah, be skeptical of solicitations for publication opportunities. Like I said a, a minute ago, it is possible to receive legitimate ones, but it is much less likely that you're going to be receiving legitimate ones than predatory ones, unfortunately. And again, if you want a second opinion, please contact the library. So what if I submitted a manuscript to a journal and now I'm concerned that they're predatory? What should I do in this situation? And this also goes for, say I have a student who is submitting their work to journals and they come to me and they're like, this journal's acting weird. Um, how do we help them in that situation? Sometimes a journal might seem legitimate at first, but then you start to engage with them and things start to feel off. So what should you do? There are some pretty big red flags that you might see after submitting your work. A lot of them relate to money. So you might receive demands for payments that weren't made clear to you before you submitted your work. The journal website may say one thing, you may get emails that ask for a lot more money or that ask for you to send your money to a country that doesn't match the journal's stated business location. That's a very big red flag. Another red flag is the journal asks you who you would like to review your work. This is not a normal peer review practice. And what this is indicative of is that the journal is uh, saying that they're providing peer review, but they are asking the author who those peers are. And the author could say, well, I'll just have them send it to my mom or my friend or whoever. And the journal is not following up or providing any quality control. They're just saying, all right, this is peer review. Somebody's reviewing it, it's real. You also might receive intimidating or aggressive communications via email if you try to ask questions or withdraw your work. So what if you or a student or a colleague submitted a manuscript and you find out that the journal is predatory after you sent in your work and you want to withdraw it? and say that that manuscript, <clears throat> excuse me, has not yet been published by the journal. First, keep a record of any emails, any communications with the journal. And via email, request, really insist that you need to withdraw your article. The journal may ask or say that you need to pay them, that they put in so much work <clears throat> on your article and they need to be compensated for all of that time that they have spent doing nothing basically. Um, they may request withdrawal charges or other charges. Don't pay them. We really do not recommend that authors do that. Definitely do not sign anything with the journal and reach out. Uh, the libraries and the Office of Research and Engagement have worked with authors on this. So every situation is different again, but uh, reach out and we can hopefully assist you with this. 
Unfortunately, if your work has actually been published by a predatory journal and you want to withdraw it, it may not be possible. So if you have transferred copyright to a journal, you may not be able to get your copyright back and you may not actually be able to get them to take down your article. I would follow some of the same steps as on the previous slide, contact the publisher or editor via email, ask them to withdraw your article, take it down from their website. Again, they may ask you to pay a fee associated with that. We don't recommend that you do that, but we do recommend that you continue to insist that the journal retract the article. And again, reaching out to the libraries and the Office of Research Engagement, we may be able to assist with this. Although in this situation, if it has been published, there may not be very much that can be done. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to say about this. Maybe it'll come back to me. So let's move forward. Um, so predatory journals are always looking for ways to uh, convince researchers to submit their work. Oh, and that's what I was gonna say. One of the reasons that a predatory journal might not want to take your scholarship down is that you might be a real and established academic, and this is a real paper that is going to convince others to submit their work. So they want those papers from legitimate scholars to be up on their site. And then other authors, potential authors would come and say, gosh, like if so-and-so is publishing here, Maybe I want to publish here. So some of these solicitations and websites can look very legitimate, and some of them have fooled many authors. If this happens to you or to one of your students or colleagues, please reach out and ask for assistance. In certain situations, it may be possible to get your scholarship back, and we may be able to help. The best way to avoid this is to do your research on the journal before you submit. We do realize that sometimes things happen and we may need to deal with things after the fact as well. So yeah, do your research and you are less likely to get entangled with a predatory journal. All right, moving on to our last question here. What if I find my name listed as a member of an editorial board for a journal I haven't agreed to be on? Why would a journal take someone's information without asking them? Why do y'all think that this might happen? Yes, it makes them look more prestigious and it helps them fill out their editorial board with real looking people. Yeah, this is a way to make their journals look legitimate and convince others to submit their work to them. So just what y'all said, Predatory publishers want to make their journals look legitimate in order to convince authors to submit their work. So in order to do this, sometimes they pull real researcher information, which might include a name, a photograph, title, affiliation, off of a university departmental website or another website where a researcher has their information. And then they use that to populate their own editorial boards, making it look like those researchers are actually affiliated with the journal. Then we have prospective authors who see that real information about those real people, and they don't know to question what they see. Why would they? So this is not exactly what I'm talking about. This is a, a, an editorial board for a predatory journal. I don't know if the person in the upper left who was listed as editor in chief, I don't know if he's real. I don't know if he knows his name is on here, but there are a lot of red flags associated with this particular editorial board. Um, we see editorial member and names, like are these real people, just icons for images. We see that person in the upper left. When I received the solicitation from the journal, it was 2019. So what had they been doing for an editor in chief in the intervening like two years since this person apparently stepped down in 2017. Um, if you saw your name on something like this, I would be very concerned. Um, but some of these editorial boards are actually set up to look much more legitimate than this particular one. So what should you do if you find your name listed as a member of an editorial board that you haven't agreed to be on? I am aware of this happening to at least one person at UNCG. It does not seem to be widespread or common, thank goodness. But if it happens to you, there are some steps to take. So email the publisher or organization and ask for your name 
and or likeness to be taken off the site. Keep a record of that email, keep a record of any responses. And then you might update your own scholarly profiles, your website, your social media, to explicitly state what your affiliations are, affiliated with UNCG, with such and such journal, and maybe to disclaim affiliation with specific publishers or journals. I am not associated with David Publishing Company or whatever it is that the journal uh, took your information and put it online. If there's any university affiliation included with the name and likeness on the predatory site, it may be a situation where uh, somebody in ORE would be able to send an email on your behalf. Um, so reach out, you might start, you might contact me and we might loop in somebody in ORE. Um, we hope that this doesn't happen, but there are, this is something that we have dealt with before here at UNCG. What if I see one of my colleagues listed as being involved with a journal that I think is questionable? This is a little dicier. You might reach out to the person and ask about their experience with the journal. Um, they may not know that their information is being used by the journal, or they may come back and say, yes, I know about that journal. I'm Here's my experience with it. So, as I mentioned earlier, there can be gray areas with journals. People may come to different determinations about whether they think such and such is a quality journal. So um, one person's, absolutely, I'm never publishing with this journal, might be another person's, yeah, that journal is fine. So uh, hopefully that's not the case with these really blatantly predatory journals, but with some that are kind of middle of the road, people have different opinions about whether or not they're worth publishing it. And to close, again, if you are in doubt about a journal, a publisher, even a conference, sadly, there are predatory conferences, reach out, ask your liaison librarian. And if you need further assistance, I am available, and there may be additional resources on campus as well, depending on the situation. So if y'all have questions, I would be glad to answer them. Also, if you have comments about anything, um, in preparation for presenting this next week. I would be glad to hear feedback. I have a resources slide. Um, so we've got a scholarly communication site here at UNCG and then a bunch of other things um, that may help in this area. And again, thanks y'all for being here. I really appreciate having an audience and the chance to run through this. All right. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to go ahead and um, turn off the recording.